Hello, F Sharp. Welcome back. Let's continue our journey of learning the basics of the F Sharp language. Today, what we are going to talk about is sets. Sets are a collection in F Sharp that allow you to keep a unique set of values. And so you may have used things like a hash set in other languages. Sets in F Sharp are, are different than that, but it's the idea of I need a collection and I wanna make sure all the items in that collection are unique. So it's for tracking unique sets of values, which is kind of the idea of why it has the name set. So let's talk about how we define a set. So the simplest way to do that is to just take a, use the set constructor and give it a sequence of elements. In this case, I am taking a list and then constructing a set from that list. And when I do that, I get my setback. And I'm actually going to move this to the bottom because I realize sometimes my video in the bottom right can block some of the results and I don't want that. So here we have a set and it's the values of one, two, and three. I can also define it. And more often I do something like this, one, two, three, where I say set and then I have the values. And when I do this, they're all in separate lines. I don't need the semicolon in between. Either one works. And what's important is that these values are unique. And so I'm gonna create A again, except I'm gonna have one, two, three, and then I'm gonna repeat three several times. And I want you to see that when I do this, I still only have the values of one, two, and three. And that's because sets are maintaining a unique set of values. And the way they are doing that under the covers is that they are using an AVL tree to store those values. Uh, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. I was just mentioning that for the curious because I wanted to know like, hey, how are you doing this? It's not using like a hash table or anything like that to keep track of distinct values. It's using an AVL tree. And so comparisons are very important. The performance of a comparison is very important for the performance of a set, but we don't have to get into those details right now. Now, you notice the way I'm constructing the set is I'm giving it a list of values. I could also do something like this and say, hey, for I in one, to three, do, and then return I. Okay, I, got, I forgot to put the equal sign in here. <laughs> so here we go. So this also works. So I'm using the list comprehension that we have discussed in a previous video. And we're saying, hey, we're still generating that same set of values. And so this is a nice way to kind of generate values using the list or array or sequence comp uh, comprehension and then creating a set from those values. Now, what's cool about sets is that they have structural equality. What do I mean by that? So, like, hey, I want to say it's A equal to B. Now, if you remember up here, B is the set of values of one, two, and three. A is also the set of values of one, two, three. I'll go ahead and comment that out to make it clearer. And so these are different references in memory. These are different places in memory at this point, but they contain the same values. And so here's an example of structural equality in F-sharp is saying, okay, these are both sets and the values contained in both sets are equivalent. Therefore, these sets are equivalent. And this is a nice from a math perspective. If you're something, someone coming from an applied math background, this is kind of what your intuition would be around this behavior, not expecting reference equality. You're expecting the structural equality. Like, hey, is the value the same? Now, if you have a set and you want to add an element to it, you could do something like this. We say like, hey, A, add, I'm going to add the value of four. And now D is the set of one, two, three, and four. So A still exists. I have not changed. A is immutable. These are immutable data structures. And so when I add and remove elements from them, I'm returning a new data structure with the new value added or removed. And just to show how to remove an element, I could say, hey, D dot remove. I want to get rid of the four. And so now I have removed the value four from the set. 
And we should say like, okay, well, A should be equivalent to E now. And that is true because they're both sets and they both contain the same set of values. Now, what happens when you try to add an element that already exists in the set? Well, what you're going to get is let's say F in this case is going to be A add one. One is already in the set. So what does it do? Well, it doesn't complain. It's just going to give you the same thing back. So no, no change. The element is already in the set. It won't raise an error or anything like that. But it also, like this, the size of the set is not going to change. Okay, cool. Well, what happens when we want to remove something and it's not in the set? So if I say remove 100. 100 is not in the set A. When I do this, it's not going to complain. It's not going to raise an error because at the end of the day, the way I think about this is that you want the set of values of A and you want it without the value of 100. Whether 100 was in there or not, you don't really care. You just want to make sure it was removed. So at the end of the day, you have successfully removed 100 from A in a way like, I'm thinking of this in terms of like, did I get the resulting set that I wanted? I don't really care whether it was actually in there or not. I just care at the end of the day that this set no longer has that value in it. And it is achieving that. So this won't uh, raise an error uh, for you. So that's a good thing to know that, hey, just because you said remove a value from a set, doesn't necessarily mean it was in the set. So you don't have to check whether it's in there or not ahead of time if you want to remove it. What's also cool about sets is that you can add them together. So set of one, two, and three, and then y is equal to set of four, five, and six. And then I want z to be equal to x plus y. So when I do this, we see that X is a set of values one, two, three. Y is a set of values four, five, and six. And Z is a set of values one, two, three, four, five, and six, which is great because you often want to like add sets together. And if you wanted to subtract different sets, you could do something like that. Uh, the subtraction result equals z minus x and when i run that the subtraction result is the set of integers and i have removed the x set of values from z and now i'm just left with four five and six and you will also see that oh come on <laughs> the subtraction result oh i know what are you doing subtraction result is equal to y at this point. So that's saying that's true. And I'm just throwing in an Easter egg here. If F sharp has this really nice thing, if you use double backticks, you can pretty much use anything as the name for a value if you want to. I find it really useful for doing testing and writing writing out nice long sentences to describe what I'm testing. But yeah, you can use this anywhere you want. So it's kind of hilarious. And the time I was creating my notes for this talk, like I couldn't think of a name. So I just put in the subtraction result. So there you go. There's a little bonus thing for the day. You can also compute different things with sets that you would want to do. So things like intersects. So I one is equal to the set of one, two, three. Let I two is equal to the set of two, three, four, and say, okay, well, I want the intersect of those two sets. So I would use set intersect I1, I2. And what the intersect will give me is the set of values that are common to both of the input sets. So when I run this, I see I1 is one, two, three, I2 is two, three, four, and the intersect of those two sets is just two and three. So two and three are the only values that are common to both of those other sets. 
there are a lot of other different functions that you can use with sets. And it all has to do with like, hey, supersets, subsets, differences. And so like, hey, if I want to take the difference of these two sets, uh, so let D1 equal to uh, set difference, I1, I2, what value is in I1 that is not in I2? And the only value that is in I1 that is not in I2 is the value of one. And if you flip this around and say like, okay, well, I want to take the difference, difference of I2, I1. Now I'm saying, give me the values in I2 that are not in I1. In that case, it's four. Four is the only value that is in the set I2 that's not in I1. So you can see, this is a fantastic collection type to use and often when I'm dealing with a problem where I have like different sets of values and this could be like rows I think one of the most common ones <laughs> is when I'm taking data from Excel and from two different worksheets and I have a table of values over here and I have a table of values over here and like okay I need to know the rows that are in this set of values that aren't in here or I want to know the values that are in here but are not in here anytime you have those little puzzles where you have two different sets of data and you're wanting to know something about the relationship between those, the set collection is a fantastic way to go and will probably make whatever it is that you're doing much, much easier. So I strongly suggest if you're running into those types of problems, reach for the set collection because it'll probably make your life a lot easier. So question for you, what are some challenging problems that you've had to deal with where you're needing to know something about what values belong in one set versus another and uh, and how would you want to be able to use the set collection to make your life easier so that's all i have for today thank you very much for spending some time with me uh, it's been a real pleasure have a great day